But here what I want to talk about, just to end, is what is normal international law? You know, because we can talk about law of sea convention, we can talk about START, we can talk about sort of these big fancy treaties that are, talk, that are debated and discussed on a regular basis, but truthfully, international and most of international is a lot less exciting uh, than that, but actually a lot more important. And so the kinds of things that you can do because of international law are the following. You always know what date and time it is anywhere on the planet, thanks to the Meridian Conference. You can mail a letter easily from any, to anywhere in the world. You can go to the US post office and slap a US stamp on it, and it can show up in Zimbabwe in a few days. Right? That is thanks to international law. Uh, we can drive cars with better safety standards. We can place and receive telephone calls worldwide. We know that a second is the same length of time everywhere in the world. Uh, we can use the same software and computers worldwide, thanks to international law. We can get an up-to-date weather forecast about our destination before we travel, watch news and events from around, around the world on television because we have a uniform system for transmission of, uh, of electronic signals, listen to the BC BBC, you guys might not want to do that, but I do, uh, and, uh, and are able to buy more affordable clothing or goods. In fact, I spend less on my daughter's clothes today than my parents spent on my clothes thanks to international and increased trade. And so when we talk about international law, we have to be careful about taking these very extreme examples and pretending that they represent the whole. They really don't. The truth is that most of international law is operating every day in a way that makes our lives better uh, and that protects the security of the United States. Uh, and so we should be careful when we're debating these issues not to imagine that some of these particular examples, like the EU, are representative of the whole. And with that, I will open it up to conversation. Thank you. Well, um, I'd like to uh, really thank uh, the organizers of uh, the panel, because I think when they uh, chose uh, the, uh, today's discussants, they did a very uh, good job. Uh, and I think uh, we've set the stage for um, a, a lively, uh, conversation. I want to begin, I guess, since um, <coughs> you just spoke, Ona, I'd like to begin by just asking you, can you think of um, uh, some binding uh, article of international law to which you take um, serious exception? Sure. This is fair turnabout. Uh, uh, I ask you if you can come up with any customary norms that ever changed our behavior. Uh, is there an international law that I disagree with? Um, actually, uh, so the one that jumps to mind immediately is the recent Security Council resolutions uh, that were uh, passed at the behest of the United States uh, that uh, are aimed at controlling uh, access to money by terrorists. Now that goal doesn't bother me in the least. In fact, I share that goal and think it's an incredibly important one and one around which there must be uh, uh, global cooperation. What I'm concerned about is actually, and I think that Jeremy probably should be and probably is actually concerned about this. This may be a concern we share. Uh, that the way that that was done uh, was done through a Security Council resolution that is then binding on all member states. Uh, and that uh, this, I think, raises concern. It's a new use of Security Council resolutions. It's a legislative type action by Security Council, which Security Council typically hasn't done. Um, and it's unlike a typical international treaty, which uh, requires national consent before the treaty is binding on the state. Um, now, the Security Council resolutions, one might argue, you've consented to by consenting to the UN, but I actually think that, but to the UN Charter, but I actually think that this is taking a step further. Um, and in fact, you see some pushback even in the European Union. The European Court of Justice has said, actually, we can't put this automatically into effect. We have to look and see to what extent this is inconsistent or consistent with our human rights obligations internal to the EU. So. That's, a, that's the first one that comes to mind. Um, and precisely because I think it's, it's inconsistent with what I see as an essential feature of most of international law, which is that it's centered on, uh, on sovereign consent to the agreements that the, the, that the state is being held to. Uh, Jeremy, I saw you raising yes, a favor. I, I mean, as you pointed out, uh, the European Court of Justice decided that actually EU law here will trump international law. So you're one example of where you say, I'm sorry, international law has gone too far. I'm siding with the EU. 
Great, that's really reassuring. <laughs> I mean, contrary to what you said at the beginning, this turns out to be international law as interpreted and presented to us by the EU. Let me, let, I, I want to ask a question of Brian because this is something that's now bothered me for, for many years. My uh, father-in-law helped negotiate the Law of the Sea uh, Convention or Treaty mm -hmm. for the European Union. And for most of the time, the negotiations dragged on for over a decade. And he found himself sitting around tables um, and composing elaborate limericks, which he was then sharing with most of his uh, uh, colleagues from uh, the European Commission, where he then served. And this um, uh, made me scratch my head and wonder, in this 1,500-page or you know, huge monster of a, of a treaty, had every line uh, been thought through uh, very carefully. This comes to mind in, in two recent uh, instances. First, with respect to um, controlling piracy off the coast of uh, Somalia, there is some question about what, um, what uh, naval ships can do or must do before they identify, sink, storm, or whatever a pirate ship. And the Law of the Sea Treaty can be read with so, so restrictively that in a, in a sense, if the pirates aren't flying the Jolly Roger, then they're pretty much on their own and explains uh, the treaty. Secondly, earlier this year, an, an unarmed um, US naval vessel, I, I suspect it was some kind of uh, ship trolling for Chinese submarines, was harassed in the uh, so-called exclusive economic zone uh, 200 miles or 150 miles off uh, Hainan, uh, Hainan uh, Island. And there was some difference about uh, what uh, exclusive economic zones entitle, uh, uh, entitle uh, you know, ships, naval ships, in terms of rights of transit, what, what they can and cannot do. Of course, if this is then going to be adjudicated, it has to be adjudicated in some kind of court overseen by uh, the convention. And I, I in my course of my reporting about this, I discovered some South Korean expert who claimed that the Chinese actually had a pretty good case. So I want to put this question maybe to Brian or, or Laura, really anyone in, in the panel. When we talk about these international conventions, they're so huge. They've been, a, they've been uh, haggled over for so long. There's so much ambiguity. But that how, how reliable a basis are they for establishing international norms that won't simply be read by each of the parties in totally different ways and, in fact, create more legal uh, confusion and chaos than they uh, resolve. So, uh, Brian, do you want to take that up first? You know, I saw so many uh, challenges within the UN Security Council on just coming to uh, agreement in terms of the implementation of very, very basic Security Council resolutions. And I think when you start getting into conventions, it becomes even more vague. And it's uh, the implementation side is everything. Um, we found in the context of even on Somalia piracy, in that case, we mostly just worked with the Somalis who were very eager to have us come into their territorial waters and do what we could to police piracy. Um, that in itself, you know, it was, was an extended and sort of tortured debate. Um, in the context of Iran or North Korea and some of these other things and very basic Security Council resolutions where they say that you know, the Security Council decides blank, you know, dot, dot, dot. The implementation is enormously hard. And I think that when you, in some of these other uh, treaties that, that, that turn that over to some sort of committee that's part of the convention to decide how these things get implemented, it becomes even fuzzier. And I think that you risk losing control over, over some sort of treaty or convention that you originally signed up for. So I think it is, especially when you have 192 countries on, you know, on this, coming to agreement on, on implementation, I think is almost unworkable. 